Welcome to today's live webinar entitled, Sales Outsourcing, Why It Should Be a Part of Your 2015 Budget. Today's program is sponsored and presented to you by Invenio Solutions. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to your host, Billy Wilkinson. Please go ahead. Thank you, Adrian. We appreciate that. And thank you to all of you for joining us today for our webinar, Sales Outsourcing, Why It Should Be Part of Your 2015 Budget. While I'm sure you've all been waiting pretty anxiously this year for someone to cover this topic, there's probably a much more pressing reason you are here with us today. Whether it be rolling into the end of the year with a miss or increased goals in 2015, many of you are looking for ways to add to your arsenal to make your number, whether it be revenue or quota. We're going to cover some key topics today on what we hear from our clients as key reasons they've decided to add outsourcing into the mix. You can see a few of the uh, agenda items up here. We've got the introduction, uh, lead conversion and sales programs, why outsourcing, and then uh, as Adrian said, we'll have some time for question and answers at the end. Uh, while we could go on for days about the benefits, we're sure you have some important things to do. So we've narrowed it down while covering some of the soft benefits as well. As well. Uh, you should see on there the ability to ask questions. I believe instead of a chat functionality, you can click on questions and submit those as well. We'll cover those, and then there will be some time for some audio um, questions as well. But first, let's start with a little poll, because I know everybody loves these. Um, we'd love to find out a little bit more about why this webinar topic appealed to you. So was it learning more about outsourced sales programs? Uh, looking for increase in quota for 2015? Is it due to a 2014 quota miss? Compare against your current outsourced programs? Or you just like listening to y'all talk? And y'all would be us because we are from Austin. We are based in Austin, Texas. So we'll just take a few minutes here. And uh, not a few minutes. We'll take about a minute while everybody enters their answers, and then we'll come back. Okay, keep just a few more seconds while we let everybody submit. Okay, now it looks like we've got some uh, some uh, results up there. So it looks like 57% uh, learning more about outsourced sales programs. That's great. This is a good place to do it. Um, and these keep changing, which is fine. 27% increase in quota for 2015. Not a big surprise that a lot of us are seeing uh, requirements to hit larger revenue numbers next year. 7% of you compare against current outsourced programs. 13% like listening to us talk, and we really appreciate you joining us. And uh, 0% 2014 quota miss, so that's nice to see too. Looks like a, a lot of people had a very successful year and are just ramping up to take uh, 2015 to the next level. So uh, real quick, you're going to be listening to three of us today. And uh, myself, my name is Billy Wilkinson. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Invenio Solutions. With me today is Emma Voss, our Director of Marketing. And we've got Christopher Turley, who we just for short will call him Turley. And he is our Director of Metrics. And so the three of them will be helping us out and uh, leading us on the slides today. But before we get too deep on the why, just a little bit about Invenio Solutions. We're a B2B full-service sales and lead development company, which that really is only a sliver of what we do. You can see part of our proud history on here, including where we've been named to the Inc. 5000 and Austin Business Journal's fastest 50 growing companies multiple times. Our services, if you go to the next slide, Emma. Thank you. Our services include inbound, outbound, cold calling, lead nurturing, and appointment setting, all which you can see on this matrix as it outlines both some of our key areas of delivery and the industries we've served for our over 150 past and present clients. In the end, 
we're more about reinventing revenue generation fueled by our culture of sales science, something we call inveniology, which is the study and implementation of data and metrics driven results. And thanks to it, each year, we generate over $1 billion in revenue and pipeline for our clients. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Emma. Thanks, Billy. <clears throat> so talking about prospects, whether you go internal or external, one thing we know for sure is you have to have prospects to have a sales program. And there are two major ways you may find prospects. One is via digital engine. If you have a digital engine, then you're concerned about the conversion journey from awareness to revenue. So many of you may be familiar with this with the sales funnel where prospects come in at one end and come out the other, hopefully, as booked revenue. So when you think of the front end of the conversion journey as a sales or marketing leader, you're really wondering whether the dollars you put into the top of your funnel actually generate revenue dollars coming out. You, you have a budget you're also trying to work with, and with that budget, you're trying to generate prospects. So you'll most probably focus on investment in content. You develop content for each stage of the conversion journey. For example, we have some examples up on the screen. Free white papers for raising awareness with a prospect. Webinars like the one we're doing right now to further interest. Um, we might have case studies and ROI tools for consideration and evaluation. But most of the time, the numbers you have to report at the end of this are really the number of prospects you generated for this conversion journey. You might still be struggling to figure out, okay, how much of that really converted and into revenue? So what if instead of saying, hey, I just generated 100 prospects, you were better able to actually predict pipeline from all these efforts? Really, no matter how automated though your process is to generate that prospect and move them along the funnel, at the end of the day, it takes a person to help you convert. We do know that digital lead conversion is automated, but up to a certain point, because lead conversion isn't. It isn't an automated process. In the B2B space, it takes people to close a sale, and more importantly, it takes the right people to close a sale. The right people equals the right revenue. And Billy will talk more about that later on in our presentation. I'm going to hand it over now to Chris Turley to talk more about another way you may generate prospects. Awesome. Thank you, Emma. And we're going to take some time on this slide to go through the initial steps of initial qualification. And this is really going to come down to lists and how do we vet lists. So another way we can gather potential prospects for a list is, is a list purchase. And as most of you know, contacts from a list purchase are much colder than if you've got that digital lead generator because you don't have that customer engagement. Now, these lists can also be just riddled with unqualified leads. I mean, we've received new business lists that just contain a majority of people that are incorpor incorporating their home hobbies, and it's probably just tax benefits and whatnot, but it's likely those aren't the prospects that you're looking for for your contacts. And it's really not worth it to have your salespeople dial those contacts. So lead qualification or demand generation services help you filter these out, allowing your salespeople to call only qualified leads. Now, how do we do this? Let's start with step one. First, we go with a contact filter. Now, there's things like invalids and duplicates, and we're all kind of used to those, but you do need to remove those. Those, those do need to be, uh, be up there. But really what's critical is the filters after that. You need a robust filter. Every program is going to be a little different, just little slight variations. But we recommend that you look at your current or even just your ideal client pro profile and really mimic these. Now, the initial set of, of filters are very simple. Is the company still in business, right? They've got to have revenue to be able to spend it. Is it the right industry? You know, are we, what are we selling and who are we selling it to? And is the product viable to the company that we're speaking to? Now, for step two, we'll go into additional filters. Now, this is where a lot of your lead qualification comes from. Now, a, a proficient outsourced lead generation partner is going to apply the appropriate filters for you and help you sort between what your unqualified and your qualified leads are, and that will really ha help aid in your sales agent's conversion rates. But two of the ways we like to look at that is, one, identifying your buyer persona. Now, the buyer personas are an essential part of B2B sales. You need to determine what characteristics you're looking for and then seek to find those. Now, another one that we like to use is the BANT method, which is very common and it's a great, effective approach. 
what BANT really does is it helps you pinpoint what a qualified lead, lead is by a simple acronym. Now, many of you have heard this, but we're still going to go through it with budget. What is the lead's budget for the product or service like yours? Do you have to help them argue for a budget, or is it ready there to be spent? And do they have the authority? Do they have the authority to make the decision? Are they just going to influence, or can they write the check? And need. Does the need that they have, is it addressed by your product or service? Obviously, that's an important one. And then timeline, which we'll go into a little further. It's also our uh, third step. But when would they make this budget, this, with this budget or decision? Now, with these four criteria, you can really paint a clear picture of whether your leads are unqualified, they're qualified, if your sales rep should be talking to them, or if it's even an opportunity worth having um, your sales reps pursue. Now let's go back to that timeline piece. A sales team qualifies leads at a higher conversion rate when they pay attention to a lead's timing requirements. Now, if a lead's looking at something like, oh, maybe we'll buy this in 18 months, that may not be who you're looking for, especially if it's a three-month sales cycle. 18 months is just way too far out there, and I've seen sales reps schedule those calls. Now, if a lead's time is more than that or in that range, they're likely not going to be qualified, and you really want to see if you can remove them, put them into a drip, um, like an email drip campaign, or maybe just put them in for a list later with different sales reps. And then, of course, we've gone down to step five, which is what customized filtering criteria can we create for any individual program? Now, there's no single criteria system that can determine a qualified lead for a specific company or a specific program. But your outsource partners will likely have a template for your industry, for your style of product. And with them, they'll help you develop a set of custom criteria that really qualifies your leads to the specific product. Now, some of the simple ones are what company size would be best for us to go after? What revenue size do they have? A lot of people have a minimum. Some people throw in a maximum. And again, what's the position title? Who do we talk to? Is it going to be the director of IT? Are we looking for the director of marketing? Or maybe it's finance software, and we really need to talk to the finance person. And then, is it the appropriate industry? Does this industry have the need that we're trying to solve with this product? And the most important step is to revisit your criteria. Qualified leads keep your sales team busy uh, with the work that matters most. So this way we can generate a better ROI and create even more revenue. Well, leave it, definitely leave it to the metrics guy to have a lot to say. That's no big surprise. <laughs> so thanks, thanks, Turley. Uh, next slide. So your outsourced sales partners have to be extremely precise with their people, something Emma talked about earlier, especially since that's what they are providing for their revenue. You're going to hear many of them talk about how they differentiate with the items I'm about to mention, and perhaps there's some truth as to whether or not they actually differentiate within a particular area. But really, you should expect to see some level of data, metrics, and quantitative support to justify moving to the right partner rather than developing an in-house solution. Either way, the right people on a program can make or break ROI. At a broad level, there are four areas that should be fine-tuned to ensure people capital are maximized in a customized sales program. Those areas are you can see on here, hiring, training, managing, and executing. Good outsource partners will be able to articulate and prove in some fashion that they are able to offer something in these areas that make their case. When executed effectively, you'll see good, not necessarily perfect, hires, faster training, and sellers that are motivated to stay on board and drive to success. Now, let's break those down to understand what's different about outsourcers in these areas. And man, do I wish we could hire the perfect rep every single time, but I just don't know that we can do that, Billy. But we get near perfect. And one of the ways that we do that is we look at the testing parameters. And here you can see that we've analyzed the tension, retention and attainment for over 700 salespeople. Now, we personally decided to work on three essential personality traits that are important to our lead generation and full cycle sales. 
Other vendors may be looking at different attributes, but it's important that they're looking at preemptive testing for their reps. Now, the three we chose is mental aptitude, aggression, and logic orientation. Now, logic orientation is whether they lean more towards people or task orientation. Now, surprise, <laughs> we're looking for a smart person that doesn't shy away from the phone call, needs to be aggressive, but not all the way aggressive. As you can actually see on the bottom table, our uh, 10 being the most aggressive, they don't make the best sales reps for us. And then, of course, they need to be able to get along with both CRMs and people. Now, from these hiring parameters, we've actually created a hiring, uh, basically a hiring walkthrough for our hiring managers to select the right employees more often. Like Billy said, this isn't going to be perfect, but if we can do it better more often, we'll be able to retain people that perform better and have better programs. So make sure that your partner is using a science or at least a data-based approach to their hiring. And Emma, hold on that for just one second, because there's something I definitely want to cover here, because we, we, we instituted this. I'd like to call back to the bullet point. It's not about the test. It's about the data behind the test, which is what Turley was saying. There are a bunch of different tests that you can use internally or externally. It's the Myers-Briggs test. It's the, it's the Wonderlick. It's, it's a lot of different tests. What I'd like to call out to everybody there is about having the data behind it. And this is where Turley did a really wonderful job, you know, especially for us. And other, other um, internal sales teams can do the same thing. When you have a statistically significant sample size of 30 or more, and you can tell where your most successful salespeople come from, as long as you run the same test and you have like size sample data, you're going to be able to get to that information and use it successfully so you can predict the success of your next, next salespeople. So, you know, I wouldn't say everyone always asks, and I got this question just recently too, uh, what tests do you use? And my point to them was, listen, it's not about the fact that we've got the test. We love our tests, and they're successful for us, but others can find those tests and use them predictively as well. So I just want to call out that particular bullet point. Okay. Next is the poll. Okay, another poll. What is the average length of a training program for your internal sales team? So each of you uh, have your sales teams that go in and get on the floor. So this isn't total ramp, but what is the length of your training program? So let's answer that for a little bit, and then we'll come back to review the results. Well, this is great. Everybody keep, we're going to go a little bit longer. This is some great information I think everybody's going to love looking at. One of the reasons we thought this would be a good question for everybody, too, is just so you can get an idea, kind of benchmark your own programs against what other uh, attendees have as well. So. Right now, we've got in the lead, 50% of everybody's training programs are between one and three months. 38% are less than one month. 6% between three and six months, and we actually have 6% greater than six months. I don't know what the number distribution is, but that, that tells us a little bit about percentages. So real quick, let's just give it a few more seconds to see if anybody else chimes in. Okay, 50% between one and three months, that's great, great information. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Oh, it's still changing. 12% between three and six months. All right, great. Let's move to the next slide, Emma. Thanks for your answers. Outsourcers tend to have much, you all knew we were setting up a, a comment, right, at this point. So outsourcers tend to have much shorter training cycles as it's crucial to get crucial to get sellers on the floor and producing better, faster. Um, it's, it's one of the things, and again, we use the 85% rule. If you get more qualified people 
and get them to 85% knowledge by the end of training, you can start to recognize the revenue faster. Firing up internal teams, and most of this will resonate with everybody on the call today. Rarely will you see initial training sessions that last less than one month, and quite often they can be as long as six months, which I think the data pointed out. The bulk of them fell between one and three months. You had about 38% that were below one month. Um, and then I can't remember, it was 12%, I think, on the others, but some of them were greater than six months. So I think that's really something that you're looking at. So I don't know about you, but if someone needs six months, you should ask fundamental questions, such as, A, are they the right person? B, will the seller be bored out of his or her mind with the training and leave? Or C, do you need to look at softening the product load? But how much training does the right person need? That's an important question we want to ask. We use both trends and qualitative and quantitative scoring to make that determination. For example, let's take a look at average date to first sale and average total sales in the first month. You can see that there in the red box in the two columns. We constantly evaluate both the Invenio overall average versus that of the last four classes to monitor, impro monitor improvement. So here we see the trend improving for both metrics. This is a good way, this is one of the ways, because sometimes things will change in training. And a trainer may change something that they think is pretty insignificant. This data in particular will show you what, what impact that change had. So the average days to first sale has gone down from 17 to 14 days. And average sale size has gone up as well from 8,500 to over 11,000. Definitely a trend our clients like. But most likely, quite possibly, your training groups don't monitor these metrics. I mean, you probably have metrics that are mission critical to your companies, whether they be revenue-oriented, efficiency-related, etc. In the end, if you're looking to get to market faster and you want to understand the metrics behind how to impact training, an outsourcer might add something to the mix here. Now, it's likely that I'm biased. But if you haven't noticed, outsourced partners, they seem, to, they seem to live and die by their data analysis. So just as Billy was talking about the analysis that we go and we do for trainers, making sure that they're covering sales, the CRM, as well as the product, we've also tried to simplify some of the other data to make it easier for our, manages, or our managers to manage their reps. And one of those ways is an example we'd like to show, which is our alchemy number. Now, the alchemy number is like a quarterback rating, but for full sales cycle reps. So what we've done is we've taken an analysis of all the high-end top performers and all our middle-of-the-range performers and then evaluated what are the core differences between them. Now, some people might think that it's dials or, you know, that it's how often do, what's their close percentage. And, and that really wasn't what was important to the bottom line performance. So what we have here is four different categories that lead into the overall. Now, Alchemy ATT, that stands for attendance. Big surprise here, right? If people are there, they can perform. But what was interesting was the small little variance that really separates an underperformer from a top performer. It's 15 minutes a day. That's it. So that's only an hour and 15 minutes a week. That's an extra break here, a little late from lunch here, and that really impacts if somebody's going to be able to sell or not. Now, if we go to the top right of that blue box, we're looking at Alchemy D slash Q. Now, that's our dials to quotes. Now, the perfect number for this program is 21 dials to each quote. And what that conversion shows is that people are taking advantage of the opportunities that they've been given. What we've also noticed is those that get out more quotes per dial or sorry, that have a lower dials per quote, is that they're better at overcoming objections, and we found a measurement for that. Then if we look at the bottom left, we have Alchemy TT. Now that's for talk time. And we really, really find that talk time indicates performance much better than dials do. And to be fair, dials, we found they're a little easier for reps to get around and to inflate their numbers. Now, what we found is it's got to be an hour and a half a day of talk time. Now, what's important is that's talk time, not call time. That's not while it's ringing. That's not voicemails. That's actual conversations with potential clients. And what we found is longer talk times 
associate to better in-depth discovery conversations and more follow-up calls. Now if we look at the bottom right-hand side for the Alchemy MRR, that number is specific to this uh, example client, and that's monthly reoccurring revenue. But what we're looking at here is the amount of signed dollars in this month. The cool part about this is that top alchemy but or that top top alchemy score, the 136, that actually predicts how somebody is going to perform for their sales next month. And what it does is it allows our call coaches to look at which reps they can help get above those quota numbers 30 days in advance. Now on our next slide, we'll see how a partner can bring some of the same level of analysis to everyday management and coaching. So you've got them in the door, you've trained them, and you know how they're performing. Well, how do you, how do you keep them? Retention, retention, retention. It's the Achilles heel of sales programs, and especially the ones that we run where you're going over the phones. Now, we've all heard all these stories about losing your best reps. Well, what if the top rep leaves? They're 20% of our production. Or even if it's just a large portion of the team, you know, leads to a new opportunity. All of these can have a huge lasting effect on a program. And each partner that you talk to, they're going to address this differently, but they need to have a plan to attack retention. Now, one of the ways that Invinio has done it is if you look at the box on our top right, we've created an attrition predictor that allows us to take into account historic numbers versus the most recent actions of a rep. And with this comparison, we're able to inform our managers of potential burnout. So if we're looking at Stacy and Steve in this example, they're actually showing indications that they could be looking for a job or leaving us within the next 14 days. And this is where we would proactively have a manager go and have that sit-down conversation. What are they looking for? How can we help retain them? How can we help keep them here? While we, if we look at below, Erin, Erin's actually in a recovery mode. She's been performing and having better activity in the last four weeks than the previous eight, which is awesome. Now, the majority of the success, though, comes from coaching management. While hiring, training, and even retaining a program's employees is of the utmost importance, we definitely have to make sure they can sell, right? So one of the things that you always have to make sure that your partner has is the proper one-on-one -on -one and call monitoring. You make sure that all reps, even the top performers, are getting the right coaching. Now, with this, we're able, and this should be a part of any program, of course, but with this, you can see that we listen to 10 different things when it comes to categories. And yeah, we've got some cut off on the, bit, on the bottom because this is actually a, quite a big tool. But it's not just closing. And you'll hear so many people say, oh, it's closing, it's closing. We actually find that intro and mirror and matching and our discovery and finding the proper solutions helps out other programs much more than just closing very hard. So these things are all very important. So we've walked you through how an outsourced sales team can be set up just for you. But coming back to your demand generation efforts, you may still be thinking, do I need an out sales outsourcer? For most of our clients, they've identified their prospects and they've found ways to reach them via events, referrals, search engine optimization, pay-per-click programs, webinars, and even list purchases. To further convert prospects into revenue, some of them actually already have in place um, sales channels, such as an e-commerce channel and even robust inside sales teams. Yet, a lot of our clients come to us asking, how can they further grow their revenue and can they do more to convert prospects into book deals? And this is where an outsourced partner can help, by becoming another channel for our revenue, thus diversifying your sales avenues. Not everybody needs an outsourced partner if they're adequately achieving revenue goals. But for those companies that require additional diversity in their sales channels, an outsourced sales partner can definitely provide that. Darlie, you there? Yep, sorry. 
I'm trying to figure out how to turn up the mic. Apparently, there's been some issues with the uh, the sound. You're sounding a little better now. So I, yeah, everybody was wanting. There were some comments. If you could speak up a little bit, that sounds better. Awesome. So as we're as you're looking at your outsource partners, it, it, whoops. Now, as we're looking at this, and it's, it's maybe because we do it more often, but I've often been really surprised with how long some companies take to launch internal teams. And a good partner, I mean, they're likely launching 10, 20 lead generation or sales programs a year. Now, and I'm sure they've gained some efficiencies. Here they're like finding a sales leader, or maybe they even have a sales leader already on staff. And even when it comes to like defining and building a script or a call flow, I'm sure they've got a couple of those on the, on the server. Or what about launching training? They probably have a sales trainer that's done it before. And with all these efficiencies, they can really get to production a whole lot faster. According to the Bridge Group, that whole lot faster can be almost a year, 11.9 months difference to production. So one of the things we look at when talking to prospects is how much it will cost internally to produce a sales team versus working with us, both from a timing perspective and an ROI perspective. Well, we hesitated to put this slide up because the default for so many companies is to think outsourcers are only about being a cheap option, and that's simply not true. If we don't provide revenue and really a decent ROI, we get fired, all outsourcers alike. In all honesty, an outsourcer could be really cheap and still get fired if there's no revenue flowing through the end of the pipe. But realistically, you will save money. You just have to be careful how you compare them. Most likely, you will get a quote per resource, a quote at a per, per resource level, and that cost could be the same as your internal resource. So let's say you multiply it by 12 and think, we could pay someone that annual salary and be fine. But could you really? What about the taxes? the benefits costs, the real estate costs, management, technology, FMLA, and the amount of time that human resources spend overall. Until you add in these additional costs, and only then, will you get an apples-to-apples -apples comparison to help you make that right decision. We've run the numbers, and this is an example where are half the cost of a client developing an internal channel, which by no means, stress this, is always the cost differential. This was an example we had. Whether or not outsourcing is the right solution at the time, I think all of us agree that at some point in our decision tree, cost will enter into the equation, no matter how great or small the savings will be. So outsourcing can offer some cost advantage, but also some expertise in some key areas. When you build incentive plans for a living, work with large numbers of salespeople on a daily basis, and have the infrastructure needed for sales teams, there is an incremental benefit. And finally, it adds a completely different advantage, the ability to fix the cost or at least know what you're going to pay for the next 12 months. When building internally year over year, your cost most likely will increase. Think about it. Benefits, pay increases, turnover, and other variable costs that you can't predict and how they increase over time, as opposed to having an outsourced solution where you know what costs you will incur and when and with much greater predictability. And as Billy was talking about, if you're not getting that ROI, it's likely that the vendor should be, you know, that you guys should part ways because that's what this is all about. As outsource partners, as you're looking at outsource partners, remember that a positive ROI is absolutely essential. Now, naturally, as Billy was talking about, when you lower cost, when you lower costs, you're gonna get a rise in ROI. However, it doesn't always happen the way that people expect. Uh, this is one of the tools that we've built to help our clients see how and when they'll start seeing ROI. Because, of course, with something like a longer sales cycle, let's say maybe six, seven months, a program may not even break even till month seven or month eight or month nine. And this is just one of the many tools that your outsourced partner may have or maybe they need to create to help communicate with you your ROI. So in the end, Engaging an outsourced sales partner may or may not be the right solution for you. We hope we've given you enough today to at least take a fresh look at outsourcers as a potential solution, something to augment your needs and meet your goals as you see fit. So with that, 
we're ready to move on to questions. So give us just a few minutes here while we sort through them, and then we will, uh, we will get right back with everybody with the questions. And just as an update, we have no audio questions at this time. Okay, great. Okay, let's answer a question of these just a second. Looks like somebody... So a couple of questions. We'll start with uh, what is the most common expected payment structure? I'm bounce around, bounce around a little bit here for an outsource team. You know, there's a couple ways to look at it. We get a lot of people that ask us for pay for performance programs overall where you get just someone wanting to pay strictly for revenue received. You know, that tends to be a big challenge for the outsourcer because you have to expend a lot of cash and resources to be able to get that fired up. Um, and, and the biggest challenge of that is not necessarily the cash flow because you know you're going to wait 45 days because of invoicing and then cash doesn't show up again for another you know once you've invoiced another 30 days after you've launched a program. So you know that tends to be that tends to be part of the challenge um, with the pay for performance program, but it's also because pay for performance is you need commitments from both sides. The most successful programs are with when both your outsourcer and the company are aligned. And so quite often with pay-for-performance programs, it's easy to go, okay, outsourcer, make it or break it. And that's not going to be successful for you, and that's not what you want. You want to make sure that you're tied together to success. So what you'll see is you'll see either an hourly or monthly uh, resource fee uh, based on the level of resource you need. And that could be different based on the rep that you need. Is it a Tier 1 rep? Is it a Tier 2, Tier 3? And those tiers just are respective to the skills needed. Are they, uh, are they much, um, much more complex products and services? Are they longer sales cycles? And then your cost, of course, is going to go up at that point. For us, often what we do is start with a fixed structure in that very first year, because we like to get to know our partners. We need to get to know the nuances of each other before we moved into some sort of leverage contract. And that's usually a happy medium that I know um, a lot of outsourcers are, outsourcers are looking at. So there's one. Okay, do you service in, apply, services apply to companies outside of the U.S. or do you only service domestic companies? Okay, so let me repeat that. Do your services apply to companies outside of the U.S., or do you only service domestic companies? Right now, uh, we do have some companies outside of the U.S., so someone we work with in particular in Canada, so it's all in North America. Uh, that's been our focus as of right now. Would we look to expand that if it made sense? Absolutely, but as of right now, it's not been a focus for us. Okay. How do you determine your cost? versus revenue you think you can produce of a 12-month period? Well, that's going to differ depending on program so and depending on the product itself. So from a cost perspective, it goes back to a couple of things. Number one is what's the level of rep we're going to need? And we actually can plug that into a, front, a pro forma to understand how much it's going to cost based on the level of rep and the number of reps which is probably directly, actually not probably, it's going to be directly tied to the, the universe of leads. I mean, if you're targeting only 500 leads total, you're not going to be able to hire up a 20 rep program. I mean, if you have millions of leads, and maybe in the SMB space, you're going to able to, you could potentially create a 100, 150 rep program. So you'll directly correlate that to the number of reps that are on that program. And that's the way you'll come at the cost. 
Revenue would be something that we would look at the average sales price for uh, that current. So if we get a new customer that comes in, we're going to try and develop pipeline because every one of our clients is interested in a couple of things. One is, what kind of pipeline are you going to deliver or actual sales are you going to deliver? It's got to be that return on investment. So we'll base project projections based on what we know from our prospects' average sales price and the length of their sales cycle, factor that in with ramp, and then we'll apply that. You saw the ROI tool that we put in there earlier. That all gets plugged in to let our clients know how they should see the revenue flow. Uh, will a recorded version of the webinar, webinar be available? Emma, can you answer that? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not sure if Lorman will be sending one out, but we will receive a recorded version. And um, my contact information is on the slide, so um, you feel whoever put in that question can also email me directly, and I will be happy to send uh, a recorded version. Can you check? Well. Can you check answered on there? Yeah, you can check that, please, as they go by. Okay. So there were two questions of, of regarding, let's see, one question was direct sales for street sales to outsource broker sales, analytics there, and analytics for end-user outsource reps versus company end-user reps. If, if You may want to contact, if you will Emma, uh, contact, email Emma, we can discuss more about getting to that particular data. I don't have anything handy on me right now to answer that. So we have a ton of analytics, and uh, we'll just see what we have, and if we don't, we'll let you know. Okay, so what kind of check-in and or reporting would I expect to see from head of team and would I have a contact with leader of team throughout contract? Absolutely. Um, you know, we like to consider ourselves and our clients like to consider us a channel. We offer, uh, we offer as many metrics as we can into the inside of the performance of the program. You know, often we use Salesforce as a CRM of choice, and so we build out dashboards. These dashboards are uh, available real-time to our clients. We have weekly, we have monthly meetings, and we also have QBRs, so quarterly business reviews. And really, those are all customized to the needs of our client. Some clients need more contact, some need less. Uh, so, you know, and that also differs from time to time depending on how the program is performing. When there are some challenges with those programs, obviously there's going to be more contact. But uh, you can expect that you have a direct line to the leader of that team. And quite often, too, we have clients that visit us on site and get to see what's going on. They see our training programs. They get to see the reps in action. So uh, that is always just customized to what the temperature of the client is. So. All right, and then we have, let's see, how are we on time? 12, okay. Well, we've got, uh, let's see, this question here. Of course you would be biased toward outsourcing. When have you seen it be best for someone to not use outsourcing? Okay, uh, absolutely, we're biased toward outsourcing. Um, now, not to the detriment of our clients, prospects, or ourselves. It does no one any good to take on a client that won't be successful um, and, and, in fact, it's worse for us in that case. Quite often, there are clients that don't need an outsource partner because everything's working. Usually, they're coming to us because there's something uh, that's either broken, they want to try, they want to amp up their they want to amp up their sale. That's especially where an outsourcer is going to fit in. But uh, some clients feel the need to best control their sales, especially when moving to a more channel-oriented model. Uh, they might engage a consultant. I mean, there's there's a different approach to take there when you hire a consultant like a McKinsey to build it out and have the money and time frame to ensure they get it right. That's just not everybody. That's just not every budget. Uh, and some clients aren't ready to outsource. There's a complicated nature to what we do and how you support us. Clients need to be ready to provide marketing, initial training material, product information, and so much more. I go back to the previous question where you ask what kind of check-in or reporting you'd expect. Well, that runs both ways because for us as well, we've got to have internal champions and contacts that can provide us a lot of information. And our most successful programs have that direct link. And when it's not there, um, it's, it, it's a, certainly a challenge. 
but in the end, our success is dependent on our client's success. So uh, we've gladly guided some clients in different directions to get them to a solution that's more fitting than, than particularly with, with outsourcing. So let's see. I guess one more. Let's do one more question. And then... How long do customers stay with you, and what is your success rate? Well, we've had customers that have been with us for as long as 14 years. Uh, we've also had some that have stayed for three months. The difference between the two I'd characterize in a couple different ways. First, we talked about commitment a second ago. It, it takes a level of commitment from both sides. Just because we're excited to work for a client, you know, that doesn't ensure the success. But when a client, and even more so an individual on the client side, champions our efforts as a sales channel, we see greater results. And second, time frame, uh, you ask how long do customers stay with us. I mean, there's two ways to look at that. Time frame is not always a function of success in our business, but more of a client's time frame. So there are times when we get three-month projects. I mean, really, we lean towards a minimum of six months to 12 months because that's where you're going to see results in some of these sales programs. But there's event optimization. There's some other things that we do for clients that are on a project basis that you might see three months. Um, now, in terms of success, the second part was what is your success rate? Well, it's hard to say what our success rate is because that differs from client to client. Uh, what I can tell you is that while I wish it was all perfect and we wish it were, we don't keep every client, often due to a breakdown by one of us in terms of uh, miscommunicated expectations or needs. So that's not the proportion of them. Uh, we do keep most of the clients. Our clients are happy. We produce well, et cetera, but it's just not a perfect batting average. Uh, where we have the most open lines of communication, uh, including access to metrics from both directions, uh, the success rate is, is pretty significant. So I hope that answers your question. Ten. So that, that was the last so that was the last question. Wow, that was a lot of talking. Great questions from everybody. I um, that concludes the webinar today and we really appreciate all your questions and everyone joining us. We've got Emma's contact information on the screen. Certainly email her. I know a couple of you had questions with regard to analytics, and we can point you in the direct, right direction. So please do email her uh, if you have anything else, or call her as well. And we hope that by spending time with us today, you're, wa you're walking away with some newfound knowledge that helps you make the best decision for you. Because that's what it's all about is we realize that you're looking to to get to a new level of success in 2015. And so we hope that you, by, by you spending some, some of your very precious time with us today, that you took away something that helps you have a most, a most successful 2015. So here's to a great 2015 to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. If you've enjoyed today's program and would like more information from Invenio Solutions, please call 512-271-6164.